As every survivor very well knows, surviving on Ark is hard to do even under the very best of conditions. However, we're gonna kick it up a notch. The rules are as follows. First, we've only given ourselves 100 days to not only survive the wilds of Lost Island, but also thrive long enough to defeat the Alpha Dinopithecus King, one of the strongest bosses on all of the arcs. As if all of that wasn't hard enough already. We have to try and accomplish it without dying a single time. Because if we do, we must restart our journey back from day one. I also decided to take this on with Arc Editions. Arc Editions has been so well developed, even Wildcard themselves have decided to endorse it. So now that everyone is caught up with the rules of the challenge, let's see what these waters have in store for us. Waking up on an abandoned beach, I did what any normal person would do. By dismantling the environment and harvesting it for my own personal gain, I also introduced myself to some of the locals. It wasn't long before I was able to craft myself up some basic tools and even an outfit. Once I had my essentials, I continued down the beach looking for a spot to set up shop. Eventually, I came across a rock formation that held a lagoon on the other side. I figured this was as good a place as any to start establishing my settlement. By the time the sun was setting, I made myself the beginnings of a shelter and even a fence. It wasn't a ton, but at least we had a place to work out of and start our pirate journey. In the morning, I thought I'd start out doing a little exploring to familiarize myself with my new environment. Nearby, I encountered a low-level Parasaur, and since we were in desperate need of assistance, this would be as good a chance as any to begin growing our crew. So I bowled it and began to bludgeon it with friendship to begin the tame. Before too long, our Parasaur was up on Adam, so I gave him a saddle, named him Hogarth, and took him on a gathering spree around the lagoon. With Hogarth's help, I was able to get a good jump on our narcotic production. And by the end of day two, I was able to convert our shelter into wood, plus trank arrows were being added to our arsenal. All in all, a pretty good day. In the morning, it was time to put our trank arrows to use. We were going to need some more gathering power if we wanted to keep advancing, and I figured the level 45 stego outside our base was the perfect man for the job. So we engaged in a little game of chase, which involved him chasing me around the beach, and then me chasing him around the beach and knocking it out. And while our new spiky friend slept, I began working on a stego saddle. By the time I had completed that, I realized it was still going to be a long while before he woke up. So I went back to grinding out materials for the base. And with a little hard work, soon I was able to make a forge. I rounded out day three by harvesting the river rocks around the lagoon so that I could begin a little bit of metal production during the night. On the morning of day four, the Stego had finished taming. I named him Gibbs. Gibbs and I instantly became pals and began harvesting wood on the way back to base. Thanks to my man Gibbs, we were able to create a smithy, and with the metal we refined from the night before, I was able to craft up some crossbows and upgrade our tools. Uh, can I help you, sir? <laughs> yeah, thanks, man. With our set of freshly crafted tools, I took Gibbs out to start restocking our supply of mats. But that's when I noticed we were about to have a real problem. Um, that's not good. We had a tech rex making its way closer and closer encroaching on the base. So I had to make a tough choice. Instead of waiting around for the rex to serve us an eviction notice that was surely coming, I decided instead to pour our resources into a raft further down the beach to escape with. This turned out to be wise because back at the base I found the rex had already begun invading our lagoon. Yeah, I'd say that just about does it. We need to go, like, right now. <laughs> By sundown, I was able to construct a ship big enough for Gibbs and Hogarth to stand on. In the morning, I made my move. I ran back to base, collected as many things as I could, and set them up on the ship. The final thing I did before fleeing the lagoon was naming our ship Mary. And once I was positive I had all the supplies we would need, we embarked on an adventure. Even though we were forced to move way earlier than expected, I still had a destination in mind that might work out for us. Turns out, life on the sea isn't terrible. I got to see some cool land formations and even some new wildlife. Oh, what is that? Is that a shark? <gasps> well, <laughs> as long as it doesn't attack us, that's good, man. Look at it. Oh, it's so cool. I figured as long as I kept sailing in shallow waters, everything would be okay. We were nearly to our destination when all hell broke loose. <gasps> it's a whale! It's a whale! <laughs> okay, we gotta get the shore. Oh, okay, there goes the boat! Uh, okay, we just gotta swim. Swim for shore, boys! Get the shore! Come with me quick! Come on, we gotta go! Oh my god. Oh my god! Look at our boat! It's so 
Carpo, dude. Oh my god, are you kidding me? We were almost there. Oh my god. Well, <laughs> I guess we're alive and we do still have some of our stuff, which is good. Oh my god. And I guess the crew was intact too, which is, I guess, a blessing. Okay. <laughs> With us still being pretty close to our destination, I still wanted to try and make some headway before nightfall. So we started to leg it on foot. Then tragedy struck a second time. What is happening right now? What? How is that Sarko hitting us? It's not, what? What is happening right now? Is it a ghost Sarko? Are we fighting an invisible Sarko right now? Oh my God, okay. We gotta just kill it, I guess. I think we're hitting it. Hogarth's hitting it. I'm not hitting it. What is going on right now, Ark? <gasps> really? <laughs> oh my god, Hogarth, no! Oh my god. Oh, oh. Okay, well, I'm glad the Sarko now wants to be where it's supposed to be and it's not invisible. Oh my god. Rip Hogarth. This is such a disaster. <laughs> And at this point, I didn't really want to take any more risks, so I just kind of hunkered down with Gibbs for the night. When we had some sunlight to work with, I checked on the perimeter of this little island to try and figure out what our next step would be. The most direct route to our destination would be a short swim around the cliff, except there was something much bigger than a Sarko, by the look of it, in the middle of our path. Um, no, no, I think, I think we're good on that one. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> The other choice seemed to be a path that led around the mountain deeper into the jungle. And just by the look from where I was standing, it was also covered in Argies. And since Gibbs was our only mount, neither option seemed great. Plus, I was not wanting to stay here and be surrounded. So I decided to take a gamble on building a second raft and hopefully avoid a whale this time. My gamble paid off, and before we knew it, we had made it over to our destination. Following this cave that led from the beach, it brought us to the inside of a hidden grotto. I would formerly name this place Pirate Hollow. With my remaining sunlight, I started clearing out the hollow and rebuilding my life inside a small nook. By sundown, I had a new shelter containing almost all our previous accoutrements, plus the addition of a spyglass. It wasn't a ton of progress considering what we had just lost, but at the very least, we had yet again built a safe place to continue living our pirate lifestyle. I started off day seven by building a bull and knocking out a low-level Terra that had flown into the hollow the night before. While that was taming, I went out on a resource run with Gibbs. Our first priority would be to secure the hollow. And from what I could tell, there were three ways inside. One cave coming from the beach that we had just used to get in, one cave leading further inland that I had just used to get more resources, and of course, the giant hole in the roof. For now, I figured it would be a whole lot easier to work on making gates and walls for the caves. Eventually, our Pteranodon tamed up and I named her Elizabeth. But with the sun clearly going down, I elected to finish grinding out our gate. And by the end of that day, we had successfully secured the hollow from any future ground invasions. Starting the morning off right, I upgraded our wardrobe to hide and set out looking for chitin so we could make Elizabeth a saddle. Lucky enough, I stumbled upon a trilobite which gave me what we needed and more. With the chitin successfully in hand, I was able to make a terra saddle and finally get a good look at what Pirate Hollow really looked like. I quickly realized it was surrounded by cliffs on all sides except for one. So that was gonna be the side we needed to secure. I accomplished that by setting up a temporary fix by building a series of spiked walls along the edge. I'll concede not the best defense, but it should hold for the time being. With our new home safe and my mind completely at ease, I continued to scout out the area, only to stumble upon a level 145 trike, and this was just too good an opportunity to pass up. We were sorely in need of an upgrade to our slow stego. So a few trank arrows later, I knocked them out and began the tame. A trike saddle blueprint, dude. Oh my God, <laughs> you can't make it up. I kept this day off by continuing the landscape pirate hollow. Morn of day nine, I ran over to collect our new trike, and I called him Frankie. I didn't have the hive we needed for his saddle blueprint yet, so Frankie and I did some battle with the wildlife to collect more. 
While out waging war, I came across a 140 Terra, and always being one to up in our flyer situation, I made quick work to Bola and knock it out, before continuing our onslaught until finally I was able to craft Frankie his saddle. Looking good, buddy! With Frankie's tractor mode unlocked, I continued to restock our supplies before heading out to retrieve the newest member of our crew, Nami. That's progress, fellas. Good progress. On day 10, I led Frankie and Gibbs out of Pirate Hollow with two goals in mind. First, to go harvest some metal nodes I had found the day prior. So I stocked both Frankie and Gibbs nearly to the brink with what I could. As for goal two, one of the main reasons I wanted to live in this part of the map is because it is one of the few locations that Beaver Dam spawn in, which always means free cementing paste. I walked around harvesting what I could before walking a very way down trike and stego back to base. Maybe I should have harvested the metal after getting the paste. <laughs> it may have taken me all day to get home, but it was a very good start nonetheless. I began day 11 by clearing out the rest of Pirate Hollow because I wanted to build us a proper workstation area. So to start off, I tried finding the very middle of the hollow with Nami. The fort wasn't very even here, so I opted for a raised platform instead. After completing the platform, I added a makeshift skirt around the outside of it out of wood railings because I just kind of thought it looked neat. To finish it off, I built three different ramps on three different sides so diamonds could get up and down the platform in ease. Then I outlined the entire thing with stone railings. On the far end of our workstation, I placed five forges since one just wasn't cutting it. On another side, I moved over our smithy and everything in it. Once that was complete, I even made us a kitchen area to contain all our mortar and pestles, plus a preserving bin. At this point, I still had some materials left over, so I used those to add pillars around the outskirts of our workstation area just to give it that extra little detail it was missing. And since I still had a little bit of sunlight left, I converted our wood shelter to a stone structure because why not? Pirate Hollow is really starting to come together, you guys. Day 12 kicked off with a resource run since I had just depleted everything we had. And with that, I made ourselves a trap and set out in search of an Argent. I ended up coming across a 130 Argent and figured this would be just fine for our purposes. So we set up our classic Argent trap, lured him in, and knocked it out. And now that we had an Argent taming that we were going to have to wait for, I decided to just take some time and explore the area. And to my amazement, I ended up coming across a Clash of Titans. A level 90 Bracky was fighting with a level 90 Acro. And not knowing what either one did at this point, I decided to just kind of watch and see what I could learn. Bro, wait, what are you doing? Oh, what's about to happen? Wait. What? Oh my god! Oh my god! Okay, no, you stay away from me. Oh, oh my god, did it just kill it by putting all its weight on top of it like Ball Blart, dude? Oh my god! <laughs> what did I just watch, man? <laughs> I also stumbled across an enormous gator creature named Dinosuchus before going back to get my RG. I named this big bird Solo. With Solo now being part of the crew, I couldn't pass up on the opportunity to do a quick metal run since, you know, metal is definitely a premium in this game. The next day I had created an Argy saddle and flew off towards the volcanoes to find some beasts of burden. Once in the volcano biome, I built up a quick taming box and began our hunt. I was able to locate a 145 Doan pretty quickly and brought it back immediately to tame. With our prehistoric armadillo sleeping, then began the search for an Anki. This one took me a much longer time to locate, but I eventually found a 140 ink and I brought him back as well to tame. Unfortunately, we were now responsible for two high-level berry tames, which meant it was going to take quite a while to tame. So in the meantime, I flew all the way back to our base and made more tricks. By day 14, our guys were up and ready to go. I named the Doed Redstone because I'm super clever and the Anki Brook. However, I wasn't ready to head home just yet. We needed one more piece of burden to complete our trio. And having just completed Scorched Earth, a thorny dragon wasn't gonna cut it this time. So I headed to the snow biome in search of a mammoth. It wouldn't be too long before I had set my eyes on a 140 mammoth. I lured it in with kind of a risky gate trap. Oh my god. <laughs> Then came back to knock it out. Since we were now stuck waiting for the mammoth to tame and there was no way we were gonna walk it back, 
I chose to spend the rest of the day trying to make cryopods. So I killed some mantis inside the volcanic insect cave and smelted a bit of metal, and finally, I had enough for three cryopods, which I used to grab both Redstone and Brook before heading back over to protect our mammoth while it finished taming. Mid-morning of day 15, the mammoth had tamed. I decided to name her Woolison. Then we took another slow flight all the way back home. At this point, I was starting to feel like it was time to start ascending out of the Dark Ages. So we constructed a fabricator, went out, killed a couple of tech creatures for the electronics, and made not one, but two oil pumps so that we could try and get out ahead of the oil curve. I only knew of one location to put these down, and that was in the desert but at least we'd have a reliable oil source from now on. With our oil reserves now in check, I decided to take Brooke out and do a metal run to kind of break him in. When I encountered something, I absolutely had to check out. What is that? Is that a sea turtle? Archelon, huh? I must have it. So I decided to cut the metal run short so we could do a little bit of research on this toidle. Turns out the Archelon is a passive tame that eats the biotoxin from jellyfish. So finding jellyfish became prime operative number one. Except, of course, I couldn't find some anywhere. I did find a better Archelon, though. Okay, I'm getting really sick of the arc logic where you can't find whatever it is you're looking for, but as soon as you're not looking for it, they're everywhere. I could have sworn that we went past like a thousand jellyfish in our boat, but I guess, I guess not. <laughs> Finally, I was able to locate a few off the desert coast and harvested the toxin. So it turns out my research was right, and the Archelon does in fact eat biotoxin. But what the research didn't tell me is it eats a lot of biotoxin. It took me the entire rest of the day to tame this thing. I decided to name him Tortuga. But then I realized you must be level 76 for an Archelon saddle and I was merely level 65. Bruh. So Tortuga was gonna have to just sit in the base for a while while we leveled up. While needing a ton of levels, it was time to go alpha hunting. I started with a level 60 alpha raptor. Oh my God. And just like that, we have better loot than everything we got in Scorched Earth. <laughs> then I began a very long assault on a level 90 alpha T-Rex I spotted earlier. This was definitely a touch ambitious, especially considering I had to go land, heal, and regain stamina like 20 times. But eventually, I did manage to whittle its health down and secure the kill. Finally, <laughs> I ended my spree of alpha hunting with a 130 alpha raptor. You know what? Nine levels is not a bad XP day. I'm not mad at it. Day 18 was a resource day, starting with some stone runs and moving to a few wood runs. I did end up replacing one of the cave walls with a behemoth gate so the mammoth could get in and out easier. Then I did a narco berry run to hold us off on that karik, and finally I went around collecting cementing paste from all the dams around our base. This would definitely stave off our cementing paste needs for a little while longer. I started off day 19 by crafting us a suit of armor, but the real plan for today was to go after a Sonoma crops. So I headed over to a place I like to call Sinnoh Valley because they spawned everywhere in here. After the fog lifted, I began the agonizing process of trying to tame one of these guys. For those of you who have never tamed a Sinnoh, I'll give you a quick rundown. They're a passive tame, but you have to let them approach you without spooking it, which is already a tricky process. If you can convince one to come near you and then feed it and it flies away again, to which you have to try and follow it around and hope you can get it to come back and eat some more. It's a finicky process to say the least. I ended up taming a low level one first, just so we'd have one, which thank God I did because I ended up chasing a 140 Sinnoh down for what felt like forever. All right, man, come eat this, please. We are like nine blocks from where we started, bro. <laughs> The reason you'd want to tame one of these is because they are essentially like a prehistoric jetpack and backpack all rolled into one. So they aren't super helpful to have, but an enormous pain to get. I ended the day by cutting our hair and beard and adding our classic fender color to the mix. Now we just gotta let it grow in. On day 20, I headed out to try and tame a Dinosuchus, the enormous gators. After some quick research, I found out apparently the best way to tame these are to wait until it basks then run up and throw meat in his mouth. So my brilliant idea was to try this out on a 140 I found earlier. Yeah, apparently you're supposed to attempt this with ghillie armor on and that makes it easier. But uh, I didn't know that. 
So instead, I grinded it out the hard way. Thank God for the Sinnoh. Because without him, I'm not sure we would have gotten the tame done, let alone live to tell a tale. Back at base, I made him a saddle, named him Brutus, and put him to the test. It turns out a Dinosuchus is pretty similar to a Sarko. The main difference besides its size is it possesses a strong charge attack called a Gigabyte. And yes, it does a lot of damage. Finding this out, I proceeded to cut Brutus loose and enjoy owning an Alpha Predator once again for the rest of the day. On day 21, I was finally high enough level to make the Archelon saddle, and I even painted it up. Now to test him out. On land, Tortuga was not very impressive, but in the water, he blew. Which was perfect, because I had just the job for him to do. The plan was to transfer the oil from the oil pumps into him, and then use Tortuga to ferry it from the desert back to our base. He played his role to perfection. That evening, I was able to start making gas, and I even threw in another metal run in for good measure. I woke up on day 22, ready to further ascend out of the Dark Ages. I started by making a generator and placing it under the platform, so they really didn't have another place to put it. Then I wired up Pirate Hollow, and even strung up a few lights around the cove. My next big upgrade was adding a grill and a couple bridges. To celebrate our upgrades, I decided to take Brutus out for a meat run, and brought him back to quite the Bayou Barbecue. The next day, I built a bunch of campfires and began burning wood in bulk for a future charcoal. While out and about, I came across a 145 Rex. So using our patented gate trap, I brought him in and began to knock him out. While exploring the area, waiting on our new Rex to tame up, I found a ramshackle crossbow BP. Unfortunately, I realized I knocked him out only 100 yards or so from a Giga spawn, so I elected to just monitor the situation from nearby, just in case something were to happen. By night, he had tamed and we had officially acquired our first Rex for the army. And yes, I named him Rambo Ray. It's just a tradition I refuse to break. To begin my day on 24, I ended up going to the wiki to find the best crystal spawns nearby. Reason being, I had a new plan in mind for the base. As a result, I spent the entire day doing crystal slash metal runs. I must have come back and forth from the mountain over 10 times. And by the end of the day, I did one last beaver dam check for cementing paste. So all of this was for an idea I had to partially enclose our roof around Pirate Hollow. This would do a couple of things. First, it would offer our a little bit more protection around the base. And two, it would kind of make Pirate Hollow feel a little bit more like a base instead of a giant crater in the side of a mountain. So step one was to use our work platform as a reference and see where to start our build. Once I figured that out, I could measure out where I wanted the edge of our hollow to be. After doing the math on those first two things, I could officially start engineering our partial dome around Pirate Hollow. And if you hadn't guessed yet, I was planning on making this roof build all out of greenhouse glass because it was going to look awesome. By the way, quick shout out to S Plus for making this build possible. By night, I had only figured out how the base of this build would work. So for the rest of the night, I spent farming even more crystal because I was very clearly going to need some more. The next day, I continued our build, working this time on the slow part of the roof. This actually turned out to be a lot trickier to figure out than I had initially thought it would be, taking up essentially the entire day to fully put together. Again, thank God for the Sinnoh because this build would have been a real pain without having. And finally, I finished the build by putting a ring of railings around the opening. Ta-da, it's kind of like a partial biodome, don't you think? <laughs> Let me know what you think of the build down below, because I think it looks really good, especially from inside, which makes it totally worthwhile in my book. It definitely added the flair Pirate Hollow was missing. Day 27 was spent almost in its entirety doing resource grinding because I had just exhausted our entire stockpile. This included revisiting the Volcano Insect Cave for Organic Polymer and Obsidian. It wasn't all bad though, because by that night, I was able to add a Ramshackle Crossbow, a Long Neck Rifle, a Harpoon Gun, and a fabricated sniper rifle to my arsenal. As a consequence of having so many new weapons added to our tool belt, I did have to spend that night grinding out miscellaneous ammo, though. On day 28, I made a terrible discovery. There was a 140 car charge just down the hill from our base, which could only mean one thing. I checked the wiki to confirm, and unfortunately, I was right. I had unknowingly built our base in a Giga Spawn. Oh. Uh... 
Only I didn't say fudge. A smart person would have moved because having a giga crash through Pirate Hollow and killing you and everything you had built would be a real run ender for sure. But I had just spent a ton of time and even more resources building a very expensive roof. So I decided I was going to try and hunker down and weather the storm. But I did begin working on a contingency plan. Step one of that plan was to tame up a few dung beetles. I set them up under our workstation with the generator because they didn't really know where else we could put them. Step two, start growing crops. For this, I built a cliff platform and placed it up near the glass since we might as well use our greenhouse since we had. Then I hastily placed a few crop plots and filled them with seeds. I could make it look a lot prettier later. For now, I just needed crops ASAP. The day was drawn to a close by installing some irrigation pipes. For now, there wasn't a whole lot I could do while we waited for our crops to grow. So I just continued to try and live my best arc life. I began by netting a 130 Maywing I had found and taming it up. Thankfully, Maywings tame up pretty quick and I named him Shanks. Then immediately flew him toward the Ice Wyvern Trench in hopes of finding some eggs we could use for some kibble. Oh my god, is that a wooly bracky? <laughs> is it just a fuzzy bracky? I love it. So after a quick scout around the edge, I made my move. That ended up going so well, I decided to check the normal trench as well. This resulted in obtaining one terrible poison egg and one amazing fire egg. Oh, 175? Oh my god. <laughs> On day 30, I had something I just had to do. I was going to enact my own Moby Dick form of vengeance on the whale who sank the Mary. With the help of both Brutus and Tortuga, we absolutely eviscerated it and wiped it from the earth. Feeling a little bit better, I came home and put on a fish fry to celebrate. Plus, I got to try on my new captain hat. I rounded up this day with a stone and metal run, so I could make more ammo plus another fabricated sniper or two. The next day, it was time to enact our contingency plan. I grabbed our crops and our narcotic and headed out. While doing some research on the Ark Edition's features, I noticed it referred to the Bracky as a Giga Killer. And having witnessed the power of the stomp myself, I was kind of inclined to believe it. So I flew back to the snow biome where I've just found that 130 wooly Bracky. Knocking out a Bracky is a little weird. First, you must aggro it and wait until it goes bipedal. As soon as this happens, you have to lay into its ankles with everything you have until it passes out from exhaustion. Again, Arsino came in clutch, making it easy to keep my distance and not get killed. Many rounds of ammo later, I'd done it. Yes! Oh my god! Finally! I built some spikes around it, and to my dismay, even with advanced crops, a Bracky was going to take a very, very, very long time to tame. I ended up having to return back to base and pick up even more narcotic. With such a costly tame in progress, I decided it would be a whole lot better if I babysat it until it was done. After a tremendous amount of waiting and patience, the Bracky tamed out late day 32. And without hesitation, I brought him immediately back to base. Upon inspection, there was really only one name worthy of such a beast, Blackbeard. With the remainder of 32, I took Blackbeard out for a test drive. All right, let's see this stomp in action. <laughs> 7,644, dude! Oh my god! <laughs> Holy cow! Okay, alright! <laughs> Evidently, these really were Giga Killers. Oh no, he just crushed its back! Oh my god! <laughs> Brutal. <laughs> With the world's largest bouncer in place, I was starting to feel a little better about the Giga situation. 33 was kind of a chores around the house sort of a day. I began by building a new taming pen complete with a deck and access ramp. The rest of the day was spent adding a few crop plots to our farm, wiring lights around the hollow, and just doing overall maintenance around the base. Oh, this looks so good, you guys. I love this so much. With how long some of the taming was taking, I was wanting more eggs for kibble. So time to go check the trenches. Except while waiting for the fog to lift, I spotted a gorgeous RG I just had to have. Hello there. Uh, huh. What the hell do we do about that? Uh, okay. Wait, 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 wait. Don't hit the bird. Oh my God. Crawl off the edge, please. <laughs> that could have been so bad, you guys. <laughs> While that was taming, I raided the Ice Wyvern Trench and walked out with three new beautiful eggs. I also did a quick scan of the normal trench to grab another egg before going back to pick up our newest member of the crew. 
I dubbed the Beckman. There are a decent amount of caves on Lost Island, and it was time we start thinking about knocking them out. Lucky for us, the best caving dino, the Dinopithecus, exists here. So, that's the day's mission. The Dinopithecus is a bit of a masochist. First, you can only tame the alpha of a troop. And after locating your target, you must gun down every member of its family. After destroying its support system, you must then damage the chosen one. Once all of these steps are done, congratulations! You now get to spend the majority of the day staring at the business end of a baboon feeding him meat. And obviously, I had to name him Luffy. At some point during the feeding, I must have dropped our Sinnoh. I did spend a bit of time looking for him, but night was quickly approaching and the Redwoods are very dangerous, so I decided to cut ties and head back to Pirate Hollow. Welcome to the big leagues, kiddo. The next day, I set up a tree platform and some tree taps to start producing a little bit of sap for kibble. Then I transported Luffy to our first cave. The reason a Dinopithecus is considered one of the best cave dinos is because while it's small, it has the same aura as a Rex, meaning most wild creatures refuse to attack it. So you can literally just run through caves. And before long, we had our first artifact. Only nine more to go. While exploring on 37, I found another high-level Rex. So, of course, we knocked him out and fed him his mutton. With a new Rex on the way, I figured it would be a good time to head back to Sinnoh Valley and try and get a new one, because our current Sinnoh was pretty bad. Of course, yet again, taming Sinnohs is a pain, but after a ton of courting, I was able to coerce a 150 Sinnoh with the joining the crew. I gave her the fitting name of Velomir, and we called that a day. By morning of 38, I was really wanting to craft our kibble so we have it on hand. Only problem? I didn't have any honey. And after a little searching, I had found us a hive. Okay, dude, if we somehow die to bees, I'm gonna be so upset. I hate you bees, I hate you bees, I hate you bees, I hate you bees. <gasps> Oh my god, Velomir! Oh my god, I forgot Sinnohs could do that! <laughs> Alright, let's go! Now having all the ingredients together, I did my best chef impersonation and whipped up a few pieces of kibble. And since I was already here, I spent the rest of the day crafting as many med brews as I possibly could. Day 39 wasn't anything special. I essentially chalked it up as a resource day. The big ones being metal wood and crafting up more gunpowder. My time was spent all around re-upping our entire stockpiles on almost everything we could. So unfortunately on day 40 I had a tech issue. I actually ended up recording day 40 and I still have the file in its entirety, all 4.8 gigs of it. And trust me when I say I have exhausted every option trying to fix it. I have spent many hours doting on this file trying to figure out a way to fix it, and alas, I it's just defeated me. I can't do it, and I'm sorry. With that being said, here's what you missed. I ended up taking some mutton from one of the nearby ovis that roamed the fields over to a 130 Dinosuchus I had found in a swamp earlier. Then I engaged in the Dinosuchus taming ritual. This time, I did use a ghillie suit, which did in fact make it much easier. I named her Tia Dalma. So now we do have a breeding set of Dinosuchus. And that's all I have to say about that. I spent day 41 scouring the swamp for frogs because I had an upcoming job for them. A frog op, if you will. Finally, a good reason to break in our taming pen. I ended up finding four different frogs. They were kind of a mixed bag of levels, more good than bad though, so I figured it would have to do. And by the end of the day, my frog op squad was assembled. Their names are Gamma Bunta, Gamma Kichi, Futasaku, and Shima, respectfully. Comment down below if you get the reference. Mad props if you do. I was still in need of a few more materials in order to craft a forge. I also remembered reading that the Bracky has a harvesting mode for stone wood, thatch metal, and berries. So I figured I'd give Blackbeard a try. And boy, oh boy, was that the best decision I've ever made. Let's give stone harvesting a shot. Holy cow! Oh my god, the Bracky is so OP. With these newfound powers unlocked, it wasn't long before we had a new industrial forge for the workshop. And that night, under the cover of darkness, I moved our frog op team into position. Today, it was time to deploy the frog ops into the insect cave. 
to identify and retrieve the artifact of the Sky Lord. On a more serious note, though, not only do the frogs get a pretty sizable damage boost on insects, but they also make some mental mist after eating the dead bug body. Our frogs did exactly what we conscripted them for, and they made short work of all the bugs in the cave, and it wasn't long before we were sitting on the mantle of the artifact of the Sky Lord. By the end of it all, we also had a fair bit of cementing paste, and any free cementing paste is definitely welcome in my book. Not bad, boys. Not bad. Day 44 was kind of a rest day, but I did make some dye and spiff up our captain outfit, and even some of the crew. Hey, looking good, you guys. As every ARC player knows, sometimes you just need a break from the grind. When it comes to breeding an ARC, I prefer to have an area of the base dedicated solely to that purpose, and Pirate Hollow is going to be no exception. Since the cliff platform worked so well with the farm, I figured I'd do the same thing for this. So I installed a handful of air conditioners for the hatching area, and even a fridge to hold the fertilized eggs until we were ready to hatch them. However, this time I tried to make it look a little nicer by enclosing it with railings and even a rope ladder for convenience. Now that our breeding area was set and ready to go, I topped off this day by shrinking a low-level wyvern for its milk. The next day, we christened the breeding area, but first I decided to breed both our rexes and our gators. To begin with, I hatched our wyvern and I named him Barbosa. Next were the gator and rex eggs. Turns out one of the Dinosuchus eggs gave us twin, which is kind of a blessing and kind of a curse. Of course, now I had five mouths to feed and imprint on, which would take a few days before they were finally grown. Eventually, when all our babies were fully grown, I didn't really know where to put them because Pirate Hollow was definitely not big enough for all these pigs. So I decided to put them in one of the caves because surely they should be safe in there for a while. Day 48, like any good pirate, I was yearning for a treasure hunt. So I grabbed Tortuga and set off for the Forbidden Jellyfish Cave. Inside this cave, you can get up to four deep sea loot crates, if done correctly. The catch is it is grounded by hundreds of jellyfish. But I had a workaround. The jellyfish didn't have an effect on an Archelon. So Tortuga was able to battleship his way in almost effortlessly. The main reason I was out here looking through drops was because I was really hoping for a shotgun blueprint. But we struck out on our first two crates. After getting the first two deep sea loot crates, if you leave the cave and then come immediately back in, the drops will have respawned, but it only works once. Ooh, okay, yep, I will definitely take that. Oh, and I'll be taking these. <laughs> nice! And since we were already on this side of town, I decided to check for eggs. I ended up finding a couple good kibble eggs. Uh, <laughs> Barbosa, I think we might have found your twin, dude. The next day I was focusing on turning those eggs into kibble when the 140 car char came to visit the beach. He was getting really close to the cave where our troops were posted up. So I was forced to intervene and drag it further into the swamp. Bro, that was way too close. The second half of the day, I spent building that sniper rifle plus ammo to go with it. Now that we had a decent weapon in our possession, I wanted to see if it would be possible to tame an acro. So off to the desert I went, where acros seemed to be running rampant. And before too long, I came across a 145. The acro is also a bit of a masochist. To knock this out, you have to get it in a defensive stance, then light it up until it lets out a roar. While roaring, you're supposed to run up and stuff as much biotoxin down its mouth as you can manage. Then rinse, lather, repeat. Honestly, all of that is easier said than done. But after a couple of attempts, I kind of got a rhythm down that seemed to work for me. Again, though, Bellamere was our MVP without a doubt. I don't know if we could have done this without her help. Go to sleep, 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 please? Yes, let's go. Because of how long it took to knock this thing out, I decided that maybe we should babysit it and make sure nothing arky happened. Super early on that morning, I decided to check some drops while waiting on our acro tape. That decision paid off in spades because sitting inside this drop was an apprentice wreck saddle blueprint. Granted by far and away, this was not the best of blueprints, but at least we would have something to use in the boss fight. Later on that morning, our acro had tame. And I gave him a lot to live up to considering I named him Roa Noah. Back at base, I made him up a saddle and proceeded to take him out into our neighborhood, performing vigilante justice on everything. Rora Noah reminded me a lot of a Rex, except it was much faster and he had a pretty strong stomp attack. Ooh, I do like that. 
I know that Agnes do get this adrenaline ability, kind of like a Giga if they take too much damage, but for the price it costs to tame these things, I still consider Rexus to probably be superior. All in all though, he was a great addition to the crew. Still needing artifacts in bulk, the day we took on our third cave. This cave was massive. It even contained an entire pirate ship just sitting inside of it. Regardless of the enormity of this cave, we still had Luffy's abilities on our side. So by and large, we were able to bypass a lot of the riffraff going on in this cave. I was able to pick our fights a little bit more strategically if I even wanted to fight at all. Luffy made these caves go from kind of a chore to a kind of a luxury, honestly. And before long, the artifact of the cunning was ours. On day 53, I made an immaculate discovery. What are those? Oh my god, it's an enormous elephant. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I will have it. After reading the wiki, I found out that these titans require beer to tame, which I had none of. So clearly that had to change. Back at base, I crafted not one, but two beer barrels to begin brewing a rum. Except that rum takes a long time to brew, apparently. Since we were clearly about to have a ton of time on our hands before the beer was ready to go, I decided it was about time to make our farm look like less of an eyesore. Just like the breeding area, I enclosed it in railings to separate it a bit. Once enclosed, I furnished it with some storage and a few compost bins to make getting fertilizer that much easier. Then, at long last, I rearranged the plots into something that made sense. Oh yeah, this is way better. During 55, I found a 140 Rex, and needing many more Rexes for our army, I couldn't turn down another breeder. So I trapped and put it out. But while that one slept, I stumbled upon another 130 female, and I figured we may as well grab this one too. So now I was gonna be responsible for not one, but two taming Rexes simultaneously, which ate up the majority of this day. On day 56, with caves still being on the mind, I set out today looking to find some Magmasaur eggs. Just get it to go, just get it to go, don't look back, don't look back. Everybody close your eyes, no one look back. <laughs> oh my god. Yes, okay, we will take that. I would end the day hoping that we could get at least two usable Magmasaurs, but escaping with my life and one great egg was perfectly fine with me. The next morning, we were still waiting for more beer to brew. So instead, I took on another cave with Loopy. This one being the Labyrinth. So the thing about the Labyrinth is it isn't so much dangerous as it is tricky. Finding our way to the first artifact was fairly straightforward. If you've done one Labyrinth on Ark, odds are you can probably do the others. Because at that point, you probably have a fairly decent grasp of all the smoke and mirrors they use to conceal their treasures. So with that in mind, and even with some past experience from this map itself, I was able to locate the second artifact pretty easy. However, finding my way out took me twice as long. Please be the final door, dude. Yes, all right, okay. <laughs> I was really starting to think we might be in there for a while. On day 58, it was time again for a breeding session. So I brought up the Rexes and the Gators. And of course, we started with our Magmasaur before hatching out the rest of the troops. However, this now made me responsible for an entire daycare class worth of kids. And as I'm sure you know by now, that meant I was stuck relegated to our base waiting hand on foot on these babies. Trying to one, make sure they live to adulthood and two, imprint all of them. By day 61, it was woefully obvious that my troops did not have the space to stay inside Pirate Hollow. So today was dedicated to clearing out a spot outside to house the army. And with the ever-present Giga Threat, I installed a perimeter of metal spikes. I figured it would have to do, and it would certainly be better than nothing. This spot outside our base was still close enough that I could monitor the situation, but not far enough away that I couldn't access it with ease. The next day, I was still really hoping we could find a shotgun blueprint. So I spent the first half of the day journeying back over to the jellyfish cave. But unfortunately, we struck out again. Luck was not on our side and I could not find us any usable blueprints inside the cave. With the remaining sunlight in this day after journeying back, I decided to take Blackbeard out on a resource gathering spree by seeing how effective he was at getting metal. And let me tell you, he is very effective at gathering metal. Thanks to the metal run from the day prior, I was finally able to get an industrial cooker up and running, which instantaneously provided some much needed relief to our kibble and medical brew production. 
because now I can finally turn all of our eggs into the kibble we could use. Every now and then, sometimes you just have to take a few seconds and admire how beautiful art can be. With many artifacts still up for grabs, the day was one of those days. And with our Magrosaur being fully grown and freshly named a Kainu, I decided it was time to unleash him and see what he could do. Today's cave was the Volcano Cave, which is extremely dangerous with rock golems and other Magmasaurs in its ranks. But with done with a great deal of patience and not charging into fights with a hot head, you can kind of maneuver your way through this cave without a hassle. And after engaging in some key fights, I was able to snag the Artifact of the Brute. Today was finally the day I had accumulated enough fear to go after a Dinotherium. So it turns out the Dinotherium tames kind of like a Dinopithecus. Step one being culling the herd and destroying its entire support system. With the weaker members of the herd being out of the picture, step two involves engaging in a game of chance by approaching the elephant with beard hand. This taming method is entirely dependent on whether or not the Dinotherium is ready to be tamed, and you can judge that based off of body language. You have to wait to see a head shake, a trunk swipe, and an ear wiggle from the elephant before you can feed it the beer. However, if the Dinotherium doesn't give you any of these three signs, then you have to back up and try again, or risk getting seriously stomped out. But surprisingly, it's actually pretty easy, and before long, we welcomed our first elephant, Sanji, to the crew. And since we still had plenty of beer left, I wagered trying to tame a female as well might be worth our while. Luckily, now that we knew where the Dinotheriums were spawning, finding the herds was not hard to do at all. And by the end of the day, we also welcomed Tashigi to our crew. Uh, one of these things is not like the other. <laughs> the next day, I crafted them up a pair of saddles and took them out on a cementing pace run to also gauge their skills. Turns out the male Dinotheriums have a bellow that boosts damage, while the female's bellow gives an armor debuff. And both of them were fairly battle savvy. Okay, these give off total Lord of the Ring vibes. <laughs> By sundown, I was completely enamored with the War Elefantes, and I was absolutely convinced that I had to find a way to work in a couple of them into our raiding party. On day 67, we reached a huge milestone in our pirate history. I had finally completed my ascension to enlightenment by crafting a chemistry bench to aid in gunpowder production and overall ordnance output, which worked like a charm. Okay, am I the only one who after immediately crafting the chemistry bench sees how fast and productive it is and then immediately gets kind of upset that I've been using mortar and pestles this entire time? Or is that kind of relatable for you guys too? <laughs> With the Dinopithecus fight looming closer, it was time to buckle down and get serious on our prep. First thing first, we still needed to get our army in order with more breeding. We heavily focused on our Rexes though, and of course, one Dinotherium. Oh, oh my god, he's perfect! Look at the little mans! However, this time while being stuck in base babysitting, I realized space in Pirate Hollow was kinda at a premium. So in order to alleviate some of that pressure and some of the space issues we were having, I added an aviary platform for our flyers, enclosed like the others and complete with a catwalk that connected all the way back to our room. I have to say, I am really liking the way this base is turning out, you guys. I was very quickly running out of time to get the remaining artifacts. So today I was gonna do my best speedrun impression and double down on them. By first traveling over to the desert and taking on that cave. The Desert Cave is essentially a pretty straight shot in order to get to the artifacts, so we were able to get in and out of that one pretty quick. From there, I had to travel to the complete other side of the map, because the next cave on my list was the Aberration Cave. The Aberration Cave is anything but a straight shot. It has a lot of twists and turns and a whole lot of chambers. And if we were on anything besides Loopy, we probably wouldn't have been able to go in there so easily. So thanks again to Luffy's overpowered abilities, we were able to walk in and grab the artifact and essentially get out scot-free. Whew, two more to go. On day 74, I took a bit of a personal day to get away from the grind. I was gonna try and tame a Zyphactinus I spotted yesterday while flying to and from the caves. And for the first time in what felt like forever, it turned out to be just a simple knockout tame. In no time at all, this oversized Barracuda was mine. And of course, I named him Jinbei. In my excitement to finally have a genuine water tame, I decided to take him all the way around the map to the treasure cave in hopes of getting a shotgun blueprint, where I proceeded to strike out again on a shotgun. 
And in my haste to get here and try and find some good loot, I kind of made a mistake. Yeah, I neglected to bring a flyer, so I was gonna have to swim all the way back home. So I was gonna have to swim from here all the way back around the map to here just to get back home. And this pirate cruise took me all night long. On day 75, our crew was still missing a few key players. So I left the base today with the idea of swelling our roster with more troops. This bore fruit pretty quickly as I was able to find a 145 Deodon, which I promptly brought back to our taming pen so we could start the knockout tame. Now that we had a doctor on the way, I used the remainder of my time trying to find a female acro. But unfortunately, that just wasn't in our cards today. I flew all around the desert looking for a high level acro. And they're not really the easiest thing to kill. I did find an Alpha Deathworm though, which was kind of a nice consolation prize. And so, without a sighting of a decent level, I went back home to feed it. With the acro situation looking pretty bleak, I elected to spend day 76, shifting our focus on finding another Bracky. Luckily, Bracky stick out like a sore thumb, so I didn't have to twist Ark's arm too much before I was able to find one. A 140 female woolly Bracky. So I began the painfully slow process of trying to take her ankles out. But finally, twas persistence that slayed the beast. I gave this Bracky all of the kibble we had made up to this point. But learning from last time, I knew this was still going to take a very, very long time, even with the kibble. So I set up a perimeter of spikes and left her there to tame. With only two more artifacts left on the board, it was time to cross them off our list. Artifact number one was the Artifact of the Hunter, which on Lost Island is the shortest cave. This cave, even more so than all the rest of them, was really easy. In fact, the only thing stopping you from getting this artifact is a simple trick. At a certain point in the cave, you have to crawl under a wall in order to get to the artifact. Luckily, I indeed had some prior knowledge this time, so I did not get stuck in this cave for 30 minutes like I did the last time. That left us with one more artifact to go. But before we could get that, I made one quick pit stop to retrieve our brand new powerhouse, Bonnie, before getting back to business collecting the last artifact we needed. This artifact is the simplest out of all of them on Lost Island. You essentially only need a scuba tank. The only thing standing between you and success of this one is merely finding it in the bottom of a sunken ship. And just like that, the artifact was ours. I know I said this earlier, but let me just take a quick sec to say, every now and then you see something so pretty in Ark, you just have to stop and take it in for a moment. Day 78. This would mark my very last chance to get some breeding done before the boss fight. And because of that, that turned out to be our largest breeding session yet, involving a whole bunch of Rexes and even two baby Dinotheriums. And of course, that did mean I was about to have to do my best wet nurse impersonation for several days trying to get these guys all the way grown up and imprinted to 100. All in all, though, we were about to have quite the little battle brigade. With a decently diverse army, there was still one member of the crew I was missing. And on 82, I set out to find our fearless leader. And to my surprise, for once, finding a high-level UD wasn't a problem. That is, until it got eaten by a pack of wolves while setting up the trap. Oh, bro, come on. Luckily, I was still able to find a UD that wasn't as good, but I would still take it. But when I got the trap up, it decided to launch itself over the cliff. Bruh, really? All right, third time's the charm. This time, my trap worked. And I was able to knock it out. Just not before tragedy struck. What? No, Barbosa crap! I left him on the cliff! Yeah, I forgot to bring Barbosa down the cliff with me when I started the tame. So we ended up getting annihilated by an Amargosaurus. Late that night, the UD tamed and I dubbed him Garp. But thanks to Barbosa's untimely passing, I now have to glide all the way home with only Bellamere. Turns out Sinnohs are a pretty decent mode of transportation. And by morning, I was home. All right, guys, so I've been giving this a lot of thought, and here's my battle strategy. I think we'll use a mix of Rexes and Dinosuchus for the Gamma, and just kind of see what happens. Then I'm thinking we should maybe use the Battle Elephants for the Beta, only because they have that buff for the attack and that nerf for incoming damage, so I'm hoping that might even out the odds. Then when it comes to Alpha, I figure we'll just use our best observations from both the Gamma and the Beta fight, and whatever worked the best for those two, I figure we'll just bring those to the Alpha fight. So, 
Yeah, that's the plan. In total, I had 20 Rexes, 10 Gators, and 3 Dinotheriums. Which, yes, in total, we had a lot more creatures than just the 20 we needed, but that was okay with me. Because based on past experiences, the likelihood of them taking some casualties were pretty high. But with this battle plan in mind, I wanted to train them up the best I could before the fight. So for the next 7 days, that's what I did. Spending almost all my time at killing things with all three waves of dinos. Specifically, I took the Rexes over to the desert where there were a lot more things to kill. I took the Dino Sucus into the swamp to try and grind out levels there just because it was convenient and close. And when it came to the Dino Therians, I took those three down the East Coast. On day 90, there was still one item I needed for the boss fight a singular Giga Heart. I was gonna put it all on the line with both of our Brackies and risk them to see if they could truly slay a Giga. All right, it's a level 60 Giga, so I'm hoping we got this. The battle that raged on between our set of Brackies and this Giga came a little bit too close for comfort, but inevitably the Giga Slayers did live up to their name and the heart was mine. Okay, I really thought we were gonna destroy it like way faster, but a win's a win, man, I'll take that. <laughs> The next three days were devoted back to the grind. The big one was making our wreck saddles from that blueprint we found. They were honestly way less than excellent, but they were just gonna have to work. Then I took our UD Garth and our Deodon Trafalgar out for some levels, because I really didn't want our utility dinos dying off before everyone else got to fight the battle. The rest of that time I spent tying up some loose ends, like going back to get an artifact of the hunter that we were gonna need. And I even hatched out our other wyvern egg. You know, the one that came from the exact same parent as Barbosa. I don't really have a good reason for doing this either. I just kind of got attached to the idea of having a wyvern. Day 95, my final day for prep before battle. This involved me getting out my very best armor and getting it ready. Then I sank every resource I had into making ammo for our sniper rifle. With our bullets crafting, I prepped our first wave for action, consisting of 11 of my very best Rexes, 7 of the best gators we had, 1 Deodon, and 1 UD. I took these troops to the nearest obelisk to get them set up. And yes, apparently we are continuing the tradition of doing a cuddle puddle of death before every fight. Alright everyone, get a nice rest. Day 96 and what we have been prepping for this entire time had finally arrived. But before going off to fight the war, I always like to take a moment or two to reflect on all we had actually accomplished in these 100 days. Since the likelihood on dying and losing the entire world forever is more likely than not. I really enjoyed my life in Pirate Hollow and I really think this base came out super unique and really cool looking. But now, I only had one goal in mind. Alrighty boys, in we go. Unlike other bosses, the Dinopithecus King Arena has a walk-in, which is kinda nice, because before you get to the battle, you get to get all your troops in formation first, before the battlefield falls into absolute chaos. And here we go. All at once, the battle erupted all around me. It was a flash of gnashing teeth, slashing claws and exploding feces. And much to my surprise, the Dino Sucus were holding the Gamma Dinopithecus King in check. Shout and curse, stabbing wildly. More brawlers than warriors. They make a wondrous mess of things. Brave amateurs, they do their part. I had learned in a previous playthrough that you want to stay as far away from the actual fight as possible. Main reason being, the Dinopithecus King throws grenades that will absolutely destroy you if you're anywhere near them. So it is best to kind of just hang out around the perimeter of the fight. And more or less, you're kind of just left to your own devices. <laughs> Alright, we just might be able to do this boys, we just might. With the Gamma out of the way, it was time to set our eyes on the Beta. I used a 97 to set up Wave 2, consisting of 15 Rexes this time, and our 3 Dinotheriums. Plus, of course, our Deodon and our Yudi. In addition to setting up all the new reinforcements and substituting out the Dino Sucus, I took this remaining time to heal up all the Rexes that were hurt from the Gamma fight. The next day, the time for the Beta fight had come. I entered the Beta Arena at Day 98, feeling nothing but confidence. And that confidence did nothing but soar when I realized my Dinotherium buff strategy was working almost to perfection. Or so I thought. Over the course of the battle, the beta started slowly picking off my troops, 
Then to make matters even worse, I dismount the Garp in order to try and get some shots off. But Garp never being one for hesitation charged immediately into the fray. Being left on foot was less than ideal. But as long as I stayed to the far outskirts of the arena, I could still do my part by laying into it with everything I had. I'm not gonna lie to you guys, the situation was looking super dire. And I was pretty sure this was going to be it, when the art god sent me a miracle. Oh, oh, yes, no way, no way, oh my god. Oh, I think we did that with like three Rexes tops left, man. I think he killed all but three Rexes. Oh my God. Turns out four Rexes made it through the beta and one Rex didn't even come in with us, which left me with a grand total of five. Yes, five good battle Rexes. And now I didn't know what to do. I was stuck trying to piece together some sort of army to fight the Alpha. The good news was I at least still had the seven Dinosuchas from the Gamma fight. All right, so good news and bad news, but mainly bad news. All right, the good news first. I did have five leftover Rexes and even three leftover Gators, which would give me 20 Dinos in total to go after the Alpha with. The bad news is there was a reason they didn't get chosen for the first two fights. They were essentially the runts of the litter and were a whole lot worse than the ones I chose to bring beforehand. And here's the other bad news. At this point, I didn't have the polymer necessary to repair our fabricated sniper rifle, which meant the apprentice long neck rifle was gonna be our next best option. Yeah, this is, uh, this is not looking so good. <laughs> oh my God, you guys, okay. I think this is gonna go over like a fart in church, but we gotta at least attempt it, right? To add insult to injury, the Alpha King dismounted me almost instantly as soon as the battle started. Oh God, dude, come on, give me a chance. The Alpha King wasted absolutely no time ravaging my men, leaving no prisoners behind. So a game time decision had to be made. I could sit back with my apprentice long neck rifle taking pot shots while the King dismantled my army in front of me, or I could charge into the battle and try and lead my men to a comfort behind victory. Hold on boys, I'm coming. Part of the ship, part of the crew, part of the ship, part of the crew, part of the ship, part of the crew, part of the ship, part of the... Dead men tell, now tell, tell, Well, I guess the king reigns supreme. There is a little something something at the end of this though, so stay tuned. I really wasn't gonna do another one of these so soon, but it did allow me to try a few mods before our next series, which will be officially starting within the next week. Let me try and warn some of you guys in advance. I am not sure when the next 100 days is going to be. These videos take an insane amount of time and effort to do. Plus, as I've mentioned before, we are not strictly a 100 days channel. We are actually an ARC channel. We do all sorts of ARC stuff and things here. Like I just mentioned, we are about to embark on a new ARC series coming up very soon. However, let me know down below, should I do this again? If you have indeed made it this far, comment down below, may the stuff and things be with you. In honor of Slipgator, one of the main inspirations behind my channel. And without further ado, enjoy the montage. Cause I don't give a what you say. Yeah, I'm a dude. My way, so you can go kick rocks. I'ma stack bricks up, build what I want to make. Yo, I got a lot of to say, so I'ma do this every day. I'll be writing things until I'm buried in my grave. Six feet deep, wonder, but my body won't decay. Cause my messages are kind of so they put them on display. Oh, yeah, I rap with a certainty. I have a sense of urgency, a message for eternity for everyone internally. I had some people burning me, but now they learn to see. I ain't the one to quit. Now they looking nervously, and I don't really care what you think of me. You think you're better see I will outwork you turn you to an enemy Hurt you so bad that you're gonna need some therapy I got the new recipe I've been cooking up hits I'ma leave a legacy You'll be looking small when you're standing right next to me I'm 5'10 but I'm 10 feet I don't get what you say Yeah I'ma do it my way So you can go kick rocks I'ma stack bricks up Build what I want to make Cause I don't give up what you say Yeah I'ma do it my way so you can go kick rocks i'm a stack breaks up build what i want to make yeah i'ma do it my way Shut 
your mouth, you can save it. I'm the same dude that got his come up from the basement. A hundred songs, a hundred weeks, didn't change it. Experiments, development, intelligence, and patience. I'll do it all again, cause I never feel complacent. Let's keep the good vibes, positivity's contagious. I'm never looking back, cause I made a life that's passionate. A college graduate suppressing all his talents, yeah. He found a way to go and change, become an advocate. For taking control of your life, go out and battle, and you think you have a dream, then act on it. Get after it, get out your head and capture it. You got one life to master it. Don't give up on your future, we all start losers. We're all late bloomers, gotta sell them through the f what you say. Yeah, I'ma do it my way. So you can go kick rocks, I'ma stack bricks up, build what I want to make. Cause I don't give a f what you say. Yeah, I'ma do it my way. Go kick rocks, I'ma stack bricks up, build what I want to make.